Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, a podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm an investigative journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are economists, scientists, politicians, academics and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic and ecological crises that we face today. And they reveal their solutions to mitigate the damage to our future. This is a critical time for our planet. It demands critical thinking. Hit the subscribe button now and go to planetcritical.com to learn more. My guest this week is Gail Bradbrook. Gail has been an activist for years. She was one of the founding members of Extinction Rebellion. She was part of Transition Towns and she's currently moved to a new project called Being the Change. So she's been thoroughly involved in activism around the climate crisis, around economy, around society, social theory. And she joined me to discuss technically the the theory of activism, how activism needs to evolve, the mistakes that activist spaces are currently making, what she would like to see more of in activist spaces and especially their relationship to the public and essentially how to move away from messaging of we're in an emergency, we need to act now, which she says is a message that is difficult for the the public to digest and engage with, and how we also create other messages around uh, the climate crisis and economic crises, i.e. here are things that you can do, here's how you can get involved, here are changes that you can make, your community can make, and here's how to connect with other people all around the world. I do hope you enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. If you love the episode, support Planet Critical on Patreon, where you'll also get access to the transcripts of these interviews. The link is in the description box below. And a big thank you to everyone who's already supporting the project. Thank you very much for joining me on Planet Critical, Gail. I'm very thrilled to speak to you. Unfortunately, due to the nature of life at the moment, um, I'm not entirely sure what we're going to be talking about because somebody contacted me, somebody that you work with to talk about the forums that you're going to be speaking in, the the economic strategy that you're working on at the moment and your work post Extinction Rebellion. Is that correct? Thanks, Rachel. It's really great to be here. I'm really loving listening to your back catalogue of interviews. Thank you. Great people on there. I could happily talk about economics, but you've had such fantastic economic people on that I just I'm not sure that that's the best use of our time I'd like to talk about how we solve the climate and ecological crisis well I I do have a line of questioning for you actually yeah. which is coming up a lot with the experts that I'm speaking with and you know they're sort of like they're academics or they're you know governmental advisors mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. essentially the thing that we keep circling back on is always why the climate movement is pushing for certain things that research says is fundamentally impossible right now. And you're such an important part of the climate movement. I would love to pick your brains. First of all, tell me about how you got involved in Extinction Rebellion. What's probably useful information for you to know, Rachel, is that right at the minute I'm sort of stepped to one side with Extinction Rebellion right. on a particular piece called being the change so extinction rebellion mm-hmm. is doing it so i'm not here to really speak for like extinction rebellion uk right. although i am a spokesperson right. i know that they're yep. working on strategy i think i actually think the world of activism is going down certain rabbit holes and getting a bit stuck there personally so there's be interesting so it may be that what you want to talk about is right up that street i'd be very interested to know more of what you think about those rabbit holes if you're willing yeah but it, it may well relate. I think it'll probably come up. Okay. So then tell me, still, I would like to know about your initial involvement with Extinction Rebellion, how you got involved in that, and then how Be The Change has evolved from that. And, I mean, what you have to say about activism in the UK and how it's evolved to respond to the climate crisis and maybe some of the flaws that, that you think need to yeah. be addressed. It's all relevant in a way to the story that I have been thinking about how things change for many, many, many years, as many of us have been, and was on a journey, just to give you a flavour of it, where as part of the Transition Towns movement, I started something called Street School Economics to teach economics on the street. And Fantastic. I was part of the tax justice movement, for example. And so one of the things that I set up back in I think 2015 was called Compassionate Revolution and it was the idea of how do we make 
the huge change that's needed. And it, it rebranded as something called Rising Up. Some people mm-hmm. thought Passionate Revolution was a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> and what it was really talking about was the paradigm that we live in and the systems that are set up and sort of how nobody's really to blame, although some people do play particular terrible roles within it, and that we have to have a movement of movements coming together Mm. who are willing to be saying no to how things are and also yes to the world that we want to create, right? And there was this sort of draft manifesto, and the idea was that you would never have a completed manifesto because what you need is a function in democracy and we don't have a function in democracy and in order to have a function in democracy you have to you, you have to be thinking together about the change that's needed so you need citizens to be in deliberative processes so that that existed and it's called rising up and it was doing various different projects testing things out and so some of us were very much working on anti-fracking, anti-incinerator stuff. There was mm-hmm. uh, people in London working on air pollution. And we came together in early 2018 and said, OK, it's time to really work together on one thing. And we all know we need to go into rebellion. Roger Hanlon mm-hmm. brought a paper saying it's time to pivot to working on the climate and ecological crisis. But I think what I'm trying to say to you is really the climate and ecological crisis is a manifestation of the fact that we're living in a way that doesn't make sense. And there are many other crises that are happening right now, obviously many of them ecological, like oceans heating, the state of our soils and waters, the mental health crises, mm-hmm. the crises around debt, around war, and, and, right? So it's mm-hmm. a, we're in an age of crises. And they all have... Mm-hmm what one could talk about the same route and if you're wanting to solve something you have to ask the biggest questions don't you like why and then you have to keep asking why in fact there's a process called the five whys you say why is this happening and then when you give an answer and why is that and why is that Mm -hmm. and I would say the first thing in activism I'm not hearing people asking why enough to, to really go through that because there's such desperation in people's bodies. It's a, a mm-hmm. feeling of desperation. So I was there at the start with Extinction Rebellion. And I think it's been a really important part of sounding an alarm, you know, to yeah. make that shift. And the sort of theory of change involves mass civil disobedience. Mm-hmm. And what I think Extinction Rebellion arose from was communities of togetherness that already existed. Mm-hmm. That ready you know as Mickey Cashtan who's a brilliant thinker said that you don't sort of create social movements you invite them into being it's already something there that wants to come yeah and so you did have like transition town groups local green party people who were sort of concerned about plastics you did have groups already of people working and knowing that we were in a state of emergency and nobody was naming it such. Mm-hmm. And so I think the reason for Extinction Rebellion's initial success was that there was already something that was waiting to happen. Mm-hmm. We caught the wave of that and we had a sort of engine room that Roger Hannum's really good at doing, actually, which is mm-hmm. mechanising mobilisation. So we had ways in which we did that through giving a talk, inviting people if they came on our social media to like us, then we would say, we'll have a talk and maybe we could start a local group. So we, we managed to create this momentum. And there'd been lots of training around what's called momentum-driven organising. And I could get into it, but just to say there's lots of things that we didn't do right. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of which we knew we weren't doing right at the time and some of which were clear sort of afterwards. Mm-hmm. And I think that the alarm has been raised and you really have to think what what how is the world different now and what do we do next which is where the work that i'm doing with a group we call being the change xr's being the change affinity network it's where that work is coming from okay let's um I'm not interested in speaking with you about what extinction rebellion did wrong in the past because There are so many articles and so many opinions on that. And I had Claire Farrell on actually way back when, when this podcast was kind of starting out, who 
delivered an excellent sort of explanation and accountability and it was just it was fantastic speaking with her I would be very, very interested to know, though, from your perspective as, as inside, you know, activism in the UK, what's going wrong now? Because what it seems to me, the more research that I get from, you know, I'm just accumulating knowledge, really, and trying to broadcast out into the world from, from speaking with all these different people. What worries me as a, as a citizen is that the research that these people are presenting me with and then the demands of activist groups they seem to be incoherent, essentially. And, and that kind of leads back into the idea of a functioning democracy. Now, I completely agree. You know, the, the dream is like the Greek agora, right? Where all citizens come and they listen to the debates and they participate in the debates and they have access to the same information. But with the amount of information that is A, out there, the amount of misinformation that is out there, and the fact that, I mean, even governments are getting it wrong, activists are getting it wrong, researchers sometimes get it wrong. I mean, are we in a stage where we have the time in this emergency to adequately educate the entire public so they can take collective decisions on what needs to be done? Just just, just to say on that particular front, that's not how deliberative democracy works. You don't ask everybody okay. about everything. You know, you can have it at different levels and at different layers. So it can happen in a town where there's a participatory budgeting on that town's budget or you could have it at the level of a country where you're looking at a particular issue and we have had a climate assembly right I mean it was focused on 2050 as a goal which is not the right timeline and they came up with a set of reasonable proposals having listened to a set of experts for example that we should have a frequent flyer tax that's not getting implemented. So the issue is that we're able to do these new forms of democracy, but we don't have the momentum to deliver on them because the politicians as they are today are still wedded to a system that's broken. If I may, and I'm going full journalist mode here. <laughs> I mean, the other issue is that like, a frequent flyer tax is a very, very, very small policy that does not um, engender the adequate change that we need to see. I mean, the emissions from global travel are, are about 3%, even focusing on emissions like carbon, methane, it's not really the root of, of, of the problem. So, I mean... I mean, just to say it's a full report, I just give you one example of what... Yeah, sure, 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 sure. It was a whole list of interventions that they came up with. The question was, how will the UK hit net zero by 2050? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not saying it's the right question that matters. But what I am saying is that deliberative democracy has happened, but already right. it's been ignored. Um, mm -hmm. What I'd be interested to know, though, is when you're uh, referring to research that's saying one thing and the demands of activists that are doing another, can you just say more specifically what research and some examples? Of course. So, so the big one uh, that comes up on the show time and time and time again, that transitioning to renewables is... A, never going to fulfill current energy demands. So it skews the actual problem, which is energy consumption. Yeah, yeah. And B, the amount of materials and energy that are required to build renewables actually make them fairly unsustainable. C, the batteries that would need to be built to yeah. store energy yeah. during times yeah. where we don't have yeah. access to the wind or the solar or whatever. There's literally not enough lithium on the planet. Yeah to create those kinds of batteries. So it's a bit of a, renewables are a bit of a pipe dream, but because there's that pipe dream there, where there's this idea of just, just transition, well, actually it's taking direction off the main problem, which is the fact that certainly in the West, UK, Europe, USA, the amount of energy that we are consuming is is the unsustainable problem. Sure, thank you, yeah. Now that is very clear, and just to say, in terms of Extinction Rebellion's demands, which have been updated recently, but what what, what, what they said was um, a citizen's assembly on climate and ecological justice. And what mm. we meant by that word, climate and ecological justice, is that it has to be done, one way of saying it, within Kate Rayworth's donut. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it has to be done within that or it's not going to work. And what you're talking about is the paradigm of growth and the, the fact that we have to move into a time of degrowth. So one of mm -hmm. the, you know, as I start telling you the story of Extinction Rebellion, it was founded, the wider strategy was rising up and it was talking there about the problems of 
economic growth and so on. And we brought that into, you know, Extinction Rebellion was a thing that Rising Up was doing. Do you see what I mean? So then Mm -hmm. what I worked on was called Money Rebellion, where what we wanted to do was bring Mm -hmm. the next level of awareness around the economic system that we live in. I mean, the issue with economic growth is it's so niche to be able to criticise it. It's growing that Mm. people are able to, but just go back three years and if you were to criticise anything about the economic system, you're going to get a label like anti-capitalist, which is an unhelpful label, I personally think, because it's a trope that means you're anti-business, you're anti-market, you don't get it, you think we should do something that was tried already and didn't work. I mean, you know, it's a signifier. And and what I would say is that we don't have a function in capitalism anyway. You know, power is allowed now. That's the thing that was brought in. It's okay to have a monopoly power. You know, you've got tax havens throughout the world. So, you know, this idea you've got transparent market that's free and fair. Nonsense, right? I mean, it's it's cronyism. Like, if you're into capitalism, you're not going to be thinking this is cool, right? So if you're sort of thinking Mm. it's good for money to find the, the place where it's needed. Now, obviously, what you need is to know what you're for, you know. So you've got some brilliant economic thinkers like Marianne Matsukatu who talks about mission-based economics. Like, what is it you're trying to achieve? And what this paradigm mm. tries to do is divide and conquer constantly. That's a shape-shifter, this paradigm. And it is going to try and find a way of saying, well, you're in this camp and you're in that camp. And actually the consciousness that's emerging at, at these days is one that integrates and synthesizes that's the job of the right brain by the way and it's a very left brain paradigm that we're in if you've come across any of the brilliant work by Ian McGill, Chris Jill, Balty Taylor and others so it's integrative so it's sort of saying you take the best of what we've learned from all these things that we've tried so it's not that there's not a role for renewable energy but as you know as you add in more renewable energy to the energy mix if you keep growing economic growth tracks resource use and there is Mm. an absolute fantasy amongst economists that we can decouple economic growth and Mm. resource use and it's nonsense it's absolutely mad I mean I oh I'm gonna forget who was on the podcast and said it I think it might have been Blair Fix but he had this wonderful five minute point in his episode where he explained how like economic growth is essentially just resource use so uh when hurricane katrina hits and they have to um rebuild all yeah. all towns essentially yeah. growth shoots up that year because there's yeah, been yeah. so much more spending and so yeah. much more use of resources and isn't it fantastic the economy is growing and it's like people's homes were destroyed jobs were lost families i mean it's madness. Yeah, I mean, there are other ways of measuring progress, you know, whether you use the sort of donut mm-hmm. um, of Kate Rayworth or there's the genuine progress indicator, which may be what Kate's using, I'm not sure, but where you, you do economic growth as measured by GDP, as defined by Simon Kuznets, who probably people know said, by the way, never use this measure as, as success because it's very, very limited in its mm. use. We do measure well-being in the UK, but don't get reported on. So, you know, you've got there's things like the right. genuine progress indicator that includes social and environmental focuses as well. And then you can see, well, are we actually making progress? Well, no, if you measure the GPI, mm. we're in recession. And you have other forms of economies i mean i'm not a great one for evoking the especially at this moment especially at this moment the 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 times of war and what they do show us are that there are times when the economy is put onto an entirely different footing in service to an existential threat Mm. you have the very brilliant work of the rapid transition alliance highly recommend i'm doing your bit at the end now (laughs) andrew sims on if you haven't already to talk about that we've done many rapid transitions but it it has to be done within the constraints so i think it's interesting when you're saying that the demands of activists and the research are not in alignment for me that's not correct but it may be it is for certain groups and or it may be just how these things get reported on because there are nuances that are part of what xr and other people have brought forwards that are not always seen you know sure um sure 
it, it's not that all activism is just the the call for transition to renewables, but arguably that is sort of the the main sounding alarm. I, I mean, mean, even with what's that, going on with there's that and there's consumer change right they're the things that get the headlines and why do they get the headlines it's because it's palatable to the current system who thinks it can switch one thing for another and this is why i say it. but then why would that be the main call of activism as well i mean if you go on, I, on I twitter I, well, and you look at climate twitter it is yeah uh-huh. i mean maybe i'm just looking in different spaces but my, my understanding for example the green new deal that was written in the uk some time ago it was also about reshaping the finance system it wasn't a superficial intervention yeah mm-hmm. i mean i no, of course I, I, I don't i don't want to entirely disagree that those things aren't pushed but I'm not pushing them, is what I will say. Sure, I know, I, I understand that completely, because I know that economics has been such a big a part of your strategy and your career as an activist, your work as an activist. I'm just, I'm interested to ask your opinion, why you think that that is still used in activist forums as a call, despite the research that, A, it might not be possible or it might be detracting from the, the question of consumption. Yeah, I, I I feel like I'm just going to say the same point again, Rachel, to be honest, mm. which is that I think that the things that get the most airtime are the things that are palatable for the current system. And it may be that some activists are stuck and haven't got the memo on the economic mm. system. And it may be that they're saying the things that they feel will be heard mm. and maybe the way the media re- is reporting it. I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure. But I would say in the last three years, I've seen a really big shift in the understanding that the economy is a problem Mm -hmm. and that there are systemic issues at play here Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. go beyond the simple issue that we didn't really notice there was a climate and ecological crisis and didn't quite get around to creating this right kind of energy i i mean the other aspect of this going back to that point about capitalism of course is the subsidy the vast subsidies of fossil fuels are, are bananas again how is that functional capitalism when you've got yeah, yeah. vast subsidizing of certain industries i mean it depends whose measures you take if you go um to, I, I think it was the imf they included the externalities and then the subsidies of skyrocketing Mm. Uh, I think it might be order 10 million dollars a second or something Mm. god that's interesting good for them it's very very rare that such a big institution will actually publish externalities well you know on the growth point though both uh, you know a body in the european union said that we have to question economic growth the bank of international settlements which is the bank of central bankers Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, they produce their green swan paper and in there is a line saying we may not be able to carry on having economic growth. The Deutsche Bank economists said, uh, you know, they quoted in the McKinsey report something like either we ask for economic growth to stop, which won't be palatable, or we carry on as we are, in which case the civilization will collapse, you know. So, So either way, economic growth is going to have to stop. It, it's just whether you do it in a sustainable way and, and with some sort of management as it happens. Yeah, understood. I think um, this is something that, I mean, this is what this podcast is trying to highlight, that the ecological crisis is a manifestation, uh, to paraphrase what you said at the beginning, of sort of, you know, energy demands and the economic crisis and, and social inequality. Um, if we were living a more equitable life, then the planet would and society would not be so out of whack. So that, that, that begs another why, though. Why is that? Why are we doing that? You know, why? Why are we letting that happen? Why is that? Why is that where we've got to? Sorry, I'm not well, interviewing you. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's interesting. I think. Well, it, you know, it depends. I had Carl Safina on the podcast, who you know, sort of highlighted the line of thought beginning with Plato and the the profanity of the physical world and how that engendered sort of the West's disrespect and disavowal of, of taking care of our bodies and our planet and our people, mm. you know, throughout history. Well, and well, this is the other thing. I mean, throughout history, if, if growth is a natural part, if growth and degradation 
are natural parts of systems. Systems mm -hmm. grow and then they collapse. Mm -hmm. um, then arguably, this is just another fall of another empire. The difference is now there's 8 billion people on the planet and it's not just an empire in a part of the world that's going to fall because, um, you know, they, I'm trying to think of it. I think it was Mesopotamia where they irrigated all of the canals and they had this incredible growth period of culture and, and food production for hundreds of years and then they ran out of water. And the human beings in that part of the world sort of disappeared, but it didn't affect the biodiversity, say, but just because there's so many of us now, we're putting the whole planet in danger. Mm -hmm. That seems to be sort of the main difference of this empire crumbling. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, it's really worth reading Graeber and Wengro's new book. Yeah. yeah. Everything about the sort of various histories and also Rutger Bregman on who we are as a human species. You know, are we mm. good? Are we bad? What I would say is that we clearly have this ability to operate in different ways, in very, very different contradictory ways. Mm -hmm. And it manifests physically in our body with the two brains that we have in our head, right? You probably know about this stuff, but, you know, the left brain is the brain that works on detail, that sees things as machines, that abstracts, that reduces and it's meant to be in service to the right brain, which sees the bigger picture. And this is true of all animals, by the way. It's not just human beings. The right brain is, is much more sort of holistic and has a sense of the divine, let's say, to put it, the sacred, and sees life as a process and a continuity. And healthy cultures support the right brain. And in fact, in some cultures, they have a story about these two aspects to ourselves that are in a problem with each other the way Ian McGilchrist talks about it is the master in his emissary you know the master is the right brain and the right brain is the visionary brain and this is what I think is very much missing in activism is where are we going what story are we telling ourselves about ourselves who are we as people yeah. human beings are meant to be a keystone species you know we have played that role in the past we are here to make the world more beautiful and yet we think we're really bad and activism is telling itself we're just awful you know we are the virus what western civilization does actively including how we educate our children is to focus on the left hemisphere and so you have this system that's based in trauma and you know one proposal is the sort of you can use this language of patriarchy white supremacy western domination paradigm power over system however you want to name it right where tico is called in the algonquin languages urugu in in some parts of africa it's called the hungry ghost in mm. buddhism it's called the rakshasas in in, in hinduism so we we know that there's this weakness in humanity where it if it's in fear it it, it 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 will operate in a certain way we have created an entire system that's based on fear and trauma and pressure and stress but what it's really good at is understanding the world as is a machine and and using that machine against itself so it will get us to you know as david graber also talked about do a bullshit job, no, it's no use, but keep your head down because you've got a mortgage to pay. Mm -hmm. And and so there's this, this really big question, like, so we've worked out so well how to do this power over paradigm, so well how to do it. And the thing with power over is that you grab resources and when you've got resources, you use it to get more resources. And, and, it, and because you're in a sort of domination loop, you, it spreads across the whole world and that's, seems to me what's what what's happened you just understand i'm saying and 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 then we we grow ourselves as westerners in a sort of blindness to it thinking this is how things are meant to be um, the the thing that i would like to touch on here is the, the pronouns we you because ultimately what we're seeing in this sort of late stage capitalism is you know in an extremely developed quote unquote a nation like the UK, were an extremely wealthy nation like the UK, uh, the middle class has been completely squeezed, economic and social precarity is increasing massively. So, I mean, when we say 
we, the West, we are doing X, Y, and Z. I mean, ultimately, surely the problem is that power, money, resources, opportunity are concentrated to such a small part of the population that are living in their own kind of paradigm where such behavior is perfectly normal, growth and domination. You know, surely one of the ways that activism needs to be going at the moment is linking up like the environment movement and the labor movement, you know, the we are the 99% movement, so that it's not West versus East, West, you know, we're all bad people doing bad things, but rather the vast, vast, vast majority of the world's population are all suffering under the same system yeah. that exists to serve a very, very, very small elitist minority. And and one could argue even with that minority, you know, you have people that are working on recovery from public school, from, from the trauma of going through the public school system, from being removed from their families age seven and putting into institutions where bullying is rife and you're being taught to think that you are here to be in charge of the world, right? I mean, yeah. I do think that the system, as I'm saying, it's a self-optimizing system. It finds the narcissists, nihilists, sociopaths, and puts them in certain positions of power. But it's still, when you make it 99 and 1%, ask the question, why again, Rachel? Like, why, if there's so few of them, are we not sorting it out? <laughs> you know, other cultures had ways of dealing with sociopaths. Actually, sometimes they killed them, frankly, if you... Yeah reading our history books and I, I think there would be a different way of of handling it but the question that you're also asking is why are we not acting as a collective yeah. so the political theorist Hannah Arendt yeah. said that the power lies in the collective so why are we not acting as a collective I would argue that first of all not everybody can be a visionary right um, and certainly a lot of people don't have the headspace for visions, they have to think about getting food on the table. But the problem that I perceive with activism at the moment is it's not offering people a dream. It's not offering people a vision to get behind. I mean, the collective is kind of, generally speaking, right? If you're a person just going about your day to day and you don't know much of the information that's out there, your mm. options are either, well, mm. maybe if I stick at this system, I might win at it, I might get ahead, or, um, okay, these people over here want to radically change my life in ways that are beyond comprehension. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no sort of like detailed plan as to what my life would look like afterwards. So I, I don't really want to join up with them. Yeah. And, and, and the media are sort of weaponizing this idea as environmentalists as bad and environmentalists against the working classes, you yeah. know, which especially upsets me. You know, I come from a coal mining community. Yeah. So... I'm in complete agreement with you. The activist space is not in dialogue with the public. So I think what Extinction Rebellion did to raise the alarm made a lot of sense and it worked Definitely. and it was novel and so on. But the leading edge of social movement theory, another person I would recommend you had on, is Stellan Vint Hagen's work. And he's synthesized the work of sort of Gene Sharp, Gandhi. Uh, you know, you've got the sort of brilliant work of Erica Chenoweth these days. Um, mm. it's, it's very clear that you have to have several different parts to your strategy. Social movement theory says there are four different things that you need to be doing. And just, you know, simplifying it, all sorts of details here. One of them is, again, Vint Hagen's language talks about utopian enactment. And that's, I would say, being the change. Like, mm -hmm. How do you do the thing? What can you do right now with the agency that you have right now? Being the change and enacting. So there are opportunities there for doing micro changes around democracy that would be important there are opportunities there around our connection with nature and, and wilding there are sort of opportunities around how you think about local food sovereignty and so on mm -hmm. so the enactment of the change and i don't mean individual consumer choices another part is dialogue and i think again a sort of activist spaces are missing this piece like how are we supposed to be in dialogue with the public especially when it's mediated through a press that is largely owned by sort of a handful of billionaires who are running their own story right what are our actions speaking to the world and how are we attempting to be in dialogue with the public and the, the very beautiful things that happened with Extinction Rebellion was that there were many sort of spin-offs, groups that found each other and one was called Trust the People and they 
are focused on the new forms of democracy. And so you can run people's assemblies. So if you're going to talk, for example, about I don't know, if you're going to block a road, maybe you should be talking about transport. Maybe you should be organising deliberative Mm. processes, you know, to be in dialogue with the public. Don't just be like fucking their day up. And how do you make cultural interventions that are lifting up our hearts and letting us know that we can do this differently? And if we're just banging people on the head with the fact that there's an emergency and they all need to panic... And putting them in their sort of, you know, I don't know if you know polyvagal theory, which is about the pain body, putting them in their sort of pain body. What, what, what One of the things that people do is they fight or they flight or they freeze. They go into dorsal vagal shutdown. We, we are a very shut down society. And if you keep an alarm ringing, if I kept making alarm noise throughout this podcast, you'd be like, ah, shush. If yeah. I may jump in here. I had Jason Hickel on the podcast to discuss degrowth. The thing that stuck out to me was one of the policies of degrowth. One of the best ways to combat emissions and resource use and all this would be moving to a four-day work week. And I was like, geez, if you say that to the general public, they'll all become activists overnight. None of us want to work five days a week. Well, you know, what one of, one of the other great policies in degrowth as well is universal basic services yes. that Anna Coop, the New Economics Foundation's done the figures on, right? It's only a few yes. percent of GDP. There is going to be a great attack on any of this stuff because it's not profit making. It's not about the profit motive. And mm. people, you know, what did I get labelled once? Some kind of Marxist primitive or something. It was ridiculous. <laughs> But it it really is a sort of, you know, you you can easily vision an economic system that has different aspects to it, like we'll provide people with their basic needs, Mm. and then free up people to do work that has meaning. We're in a time when, you know, again, Paul Hawkins book on regeneration, beautiful book, and it's based on the idea that we that the, the, the key way we need to think about this crisis is one of stopping the harm and it's repairing the harm. This yeah. is very much, you know, the language of my sister Esther is reparatory justice, you know. So I, I think that we are f- failing, that activist spaces, in my view, are failing in some of it's to do with the media, but it's not just, it's coming from within to tell the story of who we are as human beings. Yeah. And we're and, and the more that you evoke sort of emergency mentality, unfortunately, the more desperate people get. It's interesting, right? Because it's this, and I use this term a lot on this show, it's all about symbiosis, right? Because the, the issue, it seems, of empires growing and collapsing would be, you know, we sort of establish one system and we ride that system until it kills us. So even within activism, I mean, there needs to be there needs to be discussion of emergency, but there also needs to be discussion of hope and vision and prosperity for the future. So it's not about sort of shifting gears suddenly, but creating a a, a better, not better, but a it's a sort of holistic, yes, yeah, yeah an exactly. ecosystem of messages and policies. And I think you know that's what uh, we're working on with the, the piece around being the change. And it's sort of bigger than that, actually, because this this thing around connection and togetherness, that is where change comes from when people feel in a group where they feel together and they feel a deep connection, a sense of agency, sense of justice, love, you know. There does seem to be, I mean, a force in the universe. I think one of your guests spoke to it, maybe Joshua Farley, but mm. that, that, that pulls things together. I call it the magic source. <laughs> XR in its first iteration had this magic source, right? You put the pink boat on the streets and the pink boat was visionary. It was saying, yeah. nobody's coming to save us. We're saving ourselves and we're going to have fun yeah. while we do it. Yeah. And you had Waterloo Bridge and you had a sense of community and we brought trees and we were with nature and, and it, it was visionary and it was a sense of togetherness. I, I, I was telling you about the different bits of, of social movement theory. The fourth bit is called the power breaking move. It's the moment at which you say, we're not doing that anymore. That's not OK. We're stopping. So uh, being the change is about marrying the yes with the no. You know, we're saying yes to these things mm. and no to, no to other things. And so because part of the sort of, Western paradigm that sits in 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 activism 
is you know unfortunately there's a sort of white savior mentality which is we've got to save the world mm -hmm. not seeing that all over the world there are communities that are in resistance to mm -hmm. the extractive economy I mean, you've got the uh, Maasai people who are about to be evicted in, in the hundreds of thousands from their lands, right, who've been living sustainably. You know, as Paul Hawkins talking about in his book, the first, first thing we have to do in this crisis is stop the harm, right? Yeah. So when you've got Indigenous people who know how to live on the land, how to live well with that land, worked it out that they, they are of that land, you don't chuck them off the land, which yeah. is what's happening in the vast way in Brazil as, and, 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 and other places. What we have to do as a collective is understand that we are one human family and be able to act as a collective. And that requires a lot of this magic source, right? A lot of sense of connection and agency and so on. What you tend to get in activist spaces is sort of urgency of we've got to fix things, we've got to sort it out, and, 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 and doesn't do the work some people talk about solidarity it's even more than that of work of seeing our family and being in connection and sort of web 3.0 technologies allow that possibility so mm -hmm. imagine that you know whichever group you're in you might be doing a regenerative agriculture project in where i'm from in stroud or a rewilding project somewhere or focusing on new forms of democracy or economics always always to be thinking where is my history here? Whose shoulders am I standing on? Where are my ancestors? And where am I going? And who else in the world should I be connected to with this work? So that we can not just be lip service in sending out the odd tweet, but in genuine human connection. So one of the things that's happening at the minute mentioned in the Maasai is that some of the young people in Extinction Rebellion, XR Youth, formed a solidarity group. And they've made a direct human connection with the Maasai and now that attack on the Maasai people they feel it as an attack on themselves what's happening with the sort of economy of extraction is we don't feel it we often don't feel it and the extraction is happening most of it's happening in the global south and you sort of got global north activists that are thinking they're here to fix things and what we really want to do is make those human connections between our groups and our, you know, XR's Internationally Solidarity Network have been working on that for some years now. And so some of those connections are starting to be made. But we need to scale this up really rapidly. Surely also we need to be making human connections to the people in power that are running the show. Because, uh, I mean, arguably, you know, hashtags like Eat the Rich are not inviting to the people that have the most capacity to make decisions that will engender positive changes for communities around the world. That's not inspiring connection. Yeah, I know. There's another bit of social movement theory Erica Chenoweth speaks to, which are defections. So mm. if you were trying to remove a dictator, which is where a lot of sort of social change has been focused on, and Gene Sharp's work looked at that, he wrote a book about how to take down dictators, got translated into sort of 80 different languages, right? Mm -hmm. Behind the Arab Spring and all sorts. One of the moments that happens is that, say, the civil servants of that country start to defect from the dictator. Now, they might not do it very visibly, but they go on go slow or they won't do the work or they're all off sick or, you know, that sort of thing. You, you're absolutely right. We need a sort of defection strategy. So like what some of us were working on and supporting was an initiative called Leaders for Global Assemblies, in which we were inviting business leaders and other sort of leaders of prominence within the mainstream to sign a letter that said the system is the problem mm -hmm. and it incentivizes us to harm. Mm -hmm. And in order to change the system, we have to have people involved in a rewire of humanity, essentially. We have to redesign what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. And we had the sort of former global head of tax at KPMG sign it. We had Fantastic. the bank sign in that. But it could do with getting out there more. I, I had a conversation recently, and I'm waiting to see if that person's willing to put their name to this publicly, who'd been the former head of a significant uh, role within a major bank and I've also had friends my friend Donica McCarthy who writes for The Independent had somebody who was the head of sustainability in a bank saying XR's 
making our job easier. When we were breaking the bank windows, their own bank's window, they were secretly saying thank you, right? Mm. So what we're talking about is that the emperor has got no clothes on. And when you're looking at something as, as, as being systemic, it's like who can put their hands on the levers? And one of the things is to just simply name it. Like this is not working. You know, I'm going to be doing a, a talk at the Royal Economic Society. I think we need bodies like that to be saying yeah. the growth paradigm is finished, right? You don't have ecological economics be, you know, in not even in the economics department, but some other department shoved over there. If, if it's not ecological, it's not economics. You know? mm-hmm. yeah. So so we need that level of defection. And what, what happened in the first wave of XR was he had a lot of bodies declaring emergency. Good, right? Okay, the architects were declaring, the musicians were declaring and so on. We, we now need a wave of people that are making an oath to the new world, to the being the change, to what wants to come, to what's being born, to what's already around us. And we need all of us to focus on where the power actually lies. And it, it, most of it lies where the resources are that have been extracted. And most of that's in the global south. It's in the majority world. We need to operate as a body together to say to say no as we say yes to something else. You know, I, I think it's, it's in a very scattered way within this sort of interview Rachel but I can absolutely see how we could do this so that's Tell me. very exciting well it's a mixture of the things I've just said really mm. it, it would help if there was a, a sort of architecture a way of being online for people that are ready to participate in a being the change approach um, whereby as a group you're focused on the magic source, the togetherness piece, the healthy piece, the we- collaborative practices, you know, working on the ways of which, you know, what happens in activist spaces quite a bit is that um, some of it's probably due to infiltration, some of it through what we bring as activists in our desperation, but you can, p- people can bring a lot of sort of negative energy that um, makes it quite hard to work together. So that you need to work in, in your groups and they need to be rooted into the land and into the sort of acts, the places where you have agency. So direct action, this is not really a... (laughs) I'm not giving you the elevator pitch here, am I? (laughs) Direct action, you've got the direct action that's trying to stop something, like I'm going to sit in the way of this tree being cut down for HS2, and you've also got the direct action that says, I'm going to get my council, who's declared a climate emergency, to make my whole town and arc mary reynolds work acts of random kindness to the earth which is where you let a percentage of your garden go wild mm-hmm. or all the bits of the council land that where they're sort of mowing it when they just let it grow <laughs> you know yeah. carbon yeah. capture and storage into nature right these are things that people can do now so you focus on that a- a- another piece of it is that we have to get really really good at working with our trauma and healing that and there were you know I'm sorry, I'm just downloading a load of books on you today, but there's the fantastic recapture, the rapture from da- Jamie Wheel about open sourcing healing protocols that can happen. You don't have to go off somewhere mm-hmm. miles away to access some sort of sacrament. And another key piece of it is 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 what our international solidarity collaborators call globalism. It's that you always see what you're doing locally in its global context. Mm-hmm. And make the connections you know you make a human connection to another community of resistance so that you're not seeing your activity you know within this paradigm everything gets separated you're making these connections we hear from each other about what is sacred and how is our expression of sacredness how how do we connect to the land how are we repairing it's all all acts of repair that i'm talking about how are we repairing democracy ourselves our economic systems and so on and then we focus together on stopping the harm and and this is where the power breaking bit of social movement theory comes into play you say, okay, this is happening right now and this is what we can do together. I'll give you an example, right, the Adani coal mine. There's there's resistance happening on the front line to it. There's also banks wanting to fund it and there are insurance companies that need to be brought in to insure this monstrosity that's going to have this ridiculous carbon footprint if it's allowed to go ahead. That is not one person's problem, the Adani coal mine. It's everybody's issue. And 
we can all play a part in stopping that from happening. So there's a, a brilliant organisation called Market Forces. Money Rebellion have been partnering with them. And we've been using our digital rebellion processes to really go after the uh, insurance companies. There are, last count, 44 different insurance bodies that won't insure, or insure this coal mine. Right. That's what we can do at our end. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. And you can do that anywhere in the world because of online technologies if they've got connection. But we, we, we need to feel like that is our issue. It's not theirs to solve and we're over here doing this thing. So every time you're, you know, if you're resisting fossil fuel exploitation in this country, you're in connection to the extraction that's happening in Bangladesh or wherever else. I think I think that network, and I'm glad you mentioned Web 3.0 earlier, is so key because I think one of the things that's so overwhelming for ordinary citizens, say, and you'll notice as well, I'm sure, the fact that we've spoken about activists and the public, like we've atomized that, even though yeah. all of yeah. you are, we're all members of the public and we're all trying to do something. We're all citizens together. I think it can be extremely overwhelming for people when there just, there seems to be, even within the climate movement, but then the social justice movement and then, you know, the economic inequality movement and then the global south versus the global north movement or global north versus the global south, rather. It's so overwhelming. There are so many different things to focus on all the time. And people that have, you know, found their hill that they want to die on are shouting for attention on that hill, obviously, because they're trying to draw attention to it. And I think that that kind of fracturing of attention is one of the issues that we're seeing. It, it's so overwhelming for members of the public to sort of yeah. get on board generally with the big picture. Yeah. So that network, as you're saying, I mean, I personally think that that could be a key progression and evolution for, for the activist movement. It, it's sort of more than a network, right? So there would be certain criteria for being involved in it. You would mm. need it to have got some things in place and if you haven't there'll be pathways for getting those things in place yeah, no so for example yeah. if you're wanting to sort of shout and scream about your particular issue but you're not ready to do globalization to sort of be in connection and solidarity and community and communion with another group that's working on a similar thing then let's go through the pathway on localization if you're just driving people through to burnout you, you don't really want to have a regenerative culture because we're in an emergency so we haven't got time for that stuff or you just see it as a little bit of well-being or something like that there, there, there'd be sort of pathways and, and and support for i see it's quite a bit of a game really in a good way in the best version of a game a collaborative game so if you sort of picture the, the monster that has taken over the world and we collectively are going to come together and defeat this monster. There'll be a thing that you can do next that adds to the field, that strengthens the field, and there'll be pathways for that. Anthea Lawson's written a brilliant book called The Entangled Activist about what it means when uh, you're trying to dismantle the master's tools with the master's house, right? Mm -hmm. So recognising the, the master's tools. So there's that piece. But what I'm wanting to say is that part of it is if you're not – attracting in members of the public like go back to some of the basics of social yeah. media theory this is where why i think it is important the agency piece it is so overwhelming i just spent yesterday planting 400 trees on some land in a rewilding project and it was a beautiful and it was just it's so important that we root ourselves into our communities and into the land as part of this and it's not just on the intellectual. I'll, g I'll give you another example. It's the difference between, oh, I can do this as an individual and we could do this. And the value of doing this is because it is powering up. It is powering up this being the change which is ready to defeat the paradigm. And so, so as an example, right, if we were blocking traffic, you wouldn't be telling people you shouldn't be in a car. Like, I have a car. Well, obviously, what we need is to change the system, right? We need a... More public transport. Public example. transport, exactly. Yeah. You know, And it depends where you live. One of the things you could do is have a, a regional assembly about how do we need to do transport within Gloucestershire? What, what does each area need? That type of thing. Take it to the regional bodies that have some power to make changes there. But the other thing that individuals could do is to say, 
and I can speak for myself on this one, I would happily hand over my car to public ownership. Mm. Um, there are ways in which you can ch change petrol, diesel engine cars into electric vehicles and, and share them. I don't need a car, but I do need access to a car in Stroud sometimes. Uh, because even if you had lots of buses, just the nature of the hills around here, I don't think that would quite cut it. You're sort of inviting people into a system change. Pete. Well, yeah, but then, it, but then again, to be honest, my first thought was that switching to an electric vehicle is not actually that much of a system change. Pu the public ownership part, sure. I don't, that's what I'm saying. Know. Well, yeah, I, I totally agree, right? And we all know mm. the problem. Well, the vast problems with electric vehicles. I am not a, a, a big one for you know, bigging up technology. But I think in the space of transport, there are some interesting things. They used to sort of say, if you ask people what they wanted from transport years ago, they would have said faster horses because they didn't know about cars or, you know, aeroplanes or whatever, and I'm not celebrating those. But these, these sort of big shifts, people need to know that they're possible. So all I'm really trying to say is that if you're going to be working on social change, that there has to be a dialogue with the public about what the change could look like and how they could participate it in a way that's not saying, okay, you need to stress yourself out extra now because you've got yeah. to find another £50 a week for food because it's got to be organic. I think that's such a good point because so many people, I think, essentially feel so squeezed generally by the power structures that are in place and they feel that they have no voice. And maybe some of the resistance to the different movements that are going on around the world is this idea of being told once again you have to make changes, you know, you have to do this, we have the answers, rather than that dialogue that you're referring to. Mm, yeah, I, I mean, Anthony Lawson covers a lot of this in Entangled Activist, because even that label, you know, even me sort of adopting that label, it puts me in a group, and there's an in-group, out-group. So there's something even of adopting that word that can make somebody feel bad because they're, in quotes, not an activist or whatever. It creates separation. Yeah, yeah. I think there's something deeply problematic in that shadow of activism that includes you know self-righteousness um uh, ego. ego shadow mm -hmm. motivations that aren't acknowledged you know <laughs> we all could name them there's also a yeah. shadow in people who are uh, uh, non-activists that oh god uh, it's with everything yeah, no, yeah 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 it's the human so, condition <laughs> well this is what's really really beautiful about many of the sort of emergent stories now about who who and what human beings are like we understand a lot more about social psychology about why um people make certain choices that there, there are sort of psychological theories like system justification theory terror management theory there are certain things that this system again is triggering and activism is triggering them yeah. and it's like if we're going to be in dialogue we need to understand how you create togetherness through the conversations that you're having rather than a sense of separation and i don't see as yet sort of these spaces that are you know, charging around, blockading things and so on, and there'll be more to come this year, doing this deep enough thinking, which is why I've sort of taken myself off to the side to work with a group of mostly sort of Global South-focused activists and, and young people who are going, this this isn't working for us. Mm. We know that something deeper needs to happen. Well, I commend your efforts over the years, without a shadow of a doubt, and also, I mean well done on on continuing to evolve as well in the work that you're doing and constantly educating yourself i've written down every single book that you've referenced throughout this interview thank you very 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 much and i really really look forward to seeing how be the change evolves over the coming year where can people find out more about it do you know just because of that thing of not wanting to have a rush of people in that we then aren't onboarding well we haven't yeah. We haven't put things up online very much. There are bits of social media. It's being the change, by the way. Yeah, sorry, yes. I mean, no, no, it's fine. I think there, we've just got some social media up there, so people could start following that. But I, yeah, would say for now, watch this space more than... <laughs> and also just reflect. If you're in a group, you know, some of the things that we've talked about, yeah. um, where your group is at, honestly, reflect on that. Yeah. Excellent. And... Gail, who would you like to platform? Is it Andrew Sims? 
<laughs> he'd be one of them. Everybody I've mentioned. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and Anthony Lawson, Esther Stanford Jose is a, a brilliant reparationist I work with. There are many great people out there, yeah. Excellent. Gail, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. If you want to learn more about Being the Change, I've put links to their social media profiles in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to this channel and share the episode if you enjoyed it. If you loved it and want access to the interview transcripts, support Planet Critical on Patreon. The link is in the description box below. A huge thank you to the Planet Critical patrons and supporters. This work wouldn't be possible without you. Thank you all for listening. See you next week.